for me, that was never my goal. My goal was always to know the students. Uh, I'm still working on that, trying to get to know them, to learn things about them, to, to be there for them. But for me, it, uh, it's about relationships. Uh, if you look on my Facebook, I have over 1,300 friends on there. And I'm not bragging, I'm almost embarrassed because I don't know how many of those people I don't actually know. But if they send me a request, if you send me a request, if there's more than probably one mutual friend, I'm going to accept it. The way I look at it, it's just an opportunity to be able to tell people about, about Jesus, tell people about what's going on in the church, show pictures of my grandkids or what I've been eating. So, that's who, that's who I am. Now maybe some of you guys, maybe you're the life of the party. Maybe people flock to you and, and you're just open, you can talk to anybody. I know last night when we were talking to strangers walking by, some people were way over here, some people were right up here, just kind of depending. And that's fine, because we're all different. Or maybe you take that term stranger danger, and anyone that you don't know, you're afraid to be around them. So whatever you are, or wherever you are at as far as in that relationship, we all have relationships. We have them with those that either that were family relationships, those that, that we're married to, we have co-worker relationships, we have church relationships, we have relationships. And the thing about it is, we can go to Scripture and we know that through Scripture that, that God is a relational God. He didn't create us because he, he had to, but He created us to have a relationship with Him and to bring honor and glory to Him. But we're going to follow through in, in Colossians chapter 3, and we're going to look at verses mainly 12 through 14. And this whole, this whole section in here, it was, it, was kind of, it was really hard to pick out what I wanted to preach on because there's so much good stuff in here. And for those, we've been going through the greatest chapters of the scripture. We are winding down. We have just a few more, few more chapters to, to look at. But we're going to start in verse 12 and then kind of go there and really see how we can go throughout our day and have these relationships, how we can have these god honor relationships and how we can work through certain things. So before we actually get into scripture, let's pray and then we'll, we'll be sorry. Dear Heavenly Father, when we come to you and Lord, just ask for your guidance. Lord, we ask that you clear our minds of any things that we're thinking of um, that we have to do when we leave here or maybe something that even happened uh, before we got here. But I pray that we can look at your example, um, Lord, that we can follow through in, in Paul's words that we know that you gave you to help us in our everyday lives. So in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. One of the things you notice in, in chapter 3 right here in my Bible has a heading that says, Rules for Holy Living. And in the beginning, Paul looks at a couple different things in verse 5. He says, put to death. And he says, sexual morality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed. A little bit later on in verse 8, rid yourselves of all these things. Anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language. Do not lie to each other. So he, he deals with those things. And we're not going to talk, spend much time on, on that. These are things we're supposed to get rid of. These are things that are supposed to be part of our old life. Because in the beginning, it says, in Christ... So we know that those are things that are supposed to be part of our past. They're not supposed to be part of our presence. Because if you look down in verse 12, when we first see where he starts off this section, he says, therefore, okay, we, we've done this stuff that's part of who we are, but now it's time to move forward. You're over there, let's get over here. He says, therefore, as cho God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved. And one of the things about, and you may not believe this, but I love sports, um, I'm kind of an IU fan, but one of the things I don't like to do when I play sports, I don't like to pick teams. I don't like to have captains and pick this person, this person, because one, someone's always last, and I'm, I'm a people pleaser. You know, I try to keep everybody happy, but it never, doesn't always work out. So we usually just like number people off and just kind of let, the way, let it fall that way. You got the evens and the odds or, or whatever. But when we look at this here, we see that God is the one that chose us. And this is the cool thing about it is that if you don't realize what's going on here, this congregation, this church here, the, you know, because the Gentiles, this was mainly a Gentile congregation at Coloss here. So these weren't Jewish people. But now all of a sudden this church was being grouped in with God's people. So for them, instead of them feeling like they're on the outside wanting to have what, what the Jewish people had, being known as God's chosen people, now all of a sudden Paul is grouping them in there Therefore, it's God's chosen people. So kind of, they were made words of affirmation, people too. 
But they, they see this and they, they're, they're being grouped in with them. Holy and dearly loved. And I think it's so important for us that we realize before we can really work on any of these relationships. First of all, we've got to feel good about ourselves. We've got to have this relationship about who we are. And we're going to look at some, some things about it. But also, we have to have a, this relationship with God. This relationship through Christ. And when we, we realize that, when we can get that relationship where it needs to be, that begins to change our relationships with those around us. So I think Paul starts it off by saying, therefore is God's chosen people, so that we are chosen people. So we need to realize that. Not because of anything that we did. You can look at scripture and, and you know, people debate this and argue about it and try to figure out, you know, why did God choose this person? Why did God choose this person? I don't know how he did it. I know he's God. Everything he does is perfect. So instead of trying to sometimes figure it out, maybe we just need to trust him. But when we look at it, we know that, that God is the one do, doing the choosing. It's nothing that you did, nothing that you're going to do, but it's God is the one that do, does the choosing. He gives us that free gift, and we are holy and dearly loved. So we are set apart. The word holy means to be set apart for, for His service, for His work, and for His glory. But we are dearly loved. So it's important that we remember when we start thinking about relationships, the first one is our relationship with our Heavenly Father. And we see how He looks at us. And not what we've done, but what we can become. So, first thing when we look at it, we, we are chosen people. But the next part we see here, in the last part of this verse 12, it says, Clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. And I, we always have this discussion at night as far as what we're going to wear the next morning. Now, myself, I wear a uniform, so I'm wearing black pants and a red shirt. It's not so easy for Ann. She's trying to think, you know, what the weather's going to be like, what kind of shoes she's going to wear. And I can tell some of you guys out here spend a lot of time picking out sure what you're going to wear today. Some, not so much. But we want to start picking out who did it. But we know that we go through this routine about clothing ourselves in order. It's what people see. And that's what Paul is starting off here. Clothe ourselves with these, these characteristics, these, these virtues. First one we see, he talks about compassion. Some of your translations, if you have a King James Version, maybe New American Stand, it might say like vows of mercies or tender mercies. Uh -huh. And the thing about it is that vows, and we're not necessarily talking about, you know, with your regular or anything like that, but the vows, <laughs> that's deep down inside. Sorry, I didn't go there. Deep, <laughs> deep down inside because what compassion means, you are moved. To respond. You know, you can see things, you can see somebody on the side of the road, you can know about somebody having trouble, and you can say, That's, you know, I'll pray for you, and kind of go on. But when you have compassion, you do something. You know, whether it's you get out your wallet, or you go to that person, or you throw a hammer, or you're building something, I mean, not throwing a hammer, but you're, you're doing something. So this word compassion means to move, and it's deep down inside, it causes you to do something. So he says the first thing we need to do is compassion. On, on those rounds. The next thing, kindness. You know, and I was going to be fancy with this about some fancy Greek word, but this deep means to be nice to those around me. You know, and the, and the sad thing is sometimes Christians are the meanest people around. Mm -hmm. You know, and one thing that we're trying to, to work through here is we got two churches coming together. You know, please just if somebody sets you in your seat, set somewhere else. You know, it, it's one of those things that sometimes as Christians we get so set in our ways. That we don't like anybody treading on, on, on our turf. Um, but we need to be kind. We need to be nice to those people around us. Next one, humility. And Brian preached on this a few weeks ago. And it, it, it's thinking of ourselves less. And, and I struggle with this. Not thinking of myself. Sometimes I think too much of myself. Um, and what we, we realize that one that in Romans chapter 12 verse 3. I've got this up here for you. It says, for the, by, by grace given me, I say to every one of you. Do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the measure of faith God has given you. When we start thinking about humility, you know, there's, there's a couple different ways we can go. We can think of other people so much that we forget about ourselves, because we know in Ephesians, I think, where it says, you know, do not only think of yourselves, but think of others. Um, so there's a balance there that we don't forget about ourselves. 
but also the world as it revolve around us, that we realize that we are in this together. So it's important that as we get up, that we, we are, we're thinking about, you know, having compassion on those around us, that we're going to be kind to those people, that humility, also gentleness. There again, some of your translations may say meekness. Uh, and we think sometimes meek being weak, but meekness is not weak, it's power under control. So this gentleness, as far as being, being around it, it's, it's power because we know that God's working through us, that we have tremendous power, but it's under control. Um, and then one of our favorite ones, this next one, patience. How many of you guys struggle with patience? <laughs> yeah, we, a lot of times we, we, we want it and we want it now. Um, no matter what it is, we live in this, this world where everything needs to be going super fast and we want it, you know, even so much quicker. But patience is, is being able to, to bear with each other's differences. We're going to focus on, on that in, in just a little bit. But just being patient. God created each of us uniquely. We're different. You know, we like different things. We can excel at different things. There's, and we can not excel at, at, at other things. I was going to talk about how, you know, it's not about how good or bad you are at cornhole. Yes, I was horrible. Saul and I, we took on this, this two guys, and they beat us like 22 to nothing. And then Saul switched teams, and Saul's team almost won. So the problem wasn't Saul, it was me. <laughs> so and this was my own court, so it was, it was not good. But it's about being patient when, with, those, with those around us. Um, and we could look at each one of these these words and really build a, a message out of each one of these. There's so much stuff that we could learn. But if you notice Paul, he doesn't really spend a whole lot of time. He just kind of throws it out there. He says, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. And, you know, it's who we should be. It's, you know, it's almost like we have to, to wake up in the morning and, and, and put that on so it's a part of who we are as we go throughout our day. Um, so we see this, but then we also see this next part. And if we do these things, it leads to forgiveness. Forgiveness. In verse 13, it says, Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And the thing about it is, I know how Satan works sometimes. We talked about that in class, and Daniel talked about how sometimes Satan would use things that appear right to kind of convince us of certain things, but how we see Satan get in and to mess up what we think are God's plans. But one of the things in, in our high school group, one of their favorite responses to a lot of questions is what? It depends. It depends. You know, I asked them, I said, if this happens, you know, how do you respond? Well, it depends. You know, and they can almost say that to anything. And a lot of times that's how we, we live our life. It says forgive, and you know, what? should we forgive? Well, it depends what they do. You know, how bad was it? Did it physically hurt? Was it emotionally hurt? You know, was it in my face? Was it through something else? And we start coming up with all these kind of limits on I'm going to forgive, but only if it fits my, you know, kind of definition of what I'm going to forgive. But if you notice here, forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. He's not really giving us any limits here on what we're supposed to forgive. We're supposed to do it. It says that's how we should do whatever grievances we may have against one another, forgive as the Lord forgave you. What if God did that? What if He had limits? I'm going to forgive this. Would you do this? You're on your own. Or if you do this, you're on your own. But God, His forgiveness is unlimited. If we go to Him and ask Him to forgive us, He forgives us. Shouldn't we treat those around us as there might be some people in here right now where you may need to go sit beside somebody and say, you know what, I'm sorry. I've been holding something in and it's just eating away. Um, you know, I did some research and the first thing cause of death is heart disease. Um, the second is cancer. And if you've ever been around somebody that has cancer, sometimes it gets, uh, it's very small at first and it spreads. And before you know it, it just takes over the body. I think what happens with forgiveness when we don't do it it's the same way. It starts off small, and then as we don't deal with it, or we think we're dealing, but it just continues to spread, and it just consumes us, and it becomes who we are. It overtakes us. And it eats away that's just the same way that a disease does. 
But we know that, that Paul is telling us that it's so important for us to, um, to forgive. I got this picture here and I want to... Oh, man. I worked on this earlier. All right. See the gentleman over there to the right? It's Matthew West. He's a Christian singer that we've seen at some concerts and stuff like that. And this nice couple that you see up here, the lady, her daughter was killed by a drunk driver. The guy was the guy driving the car. She, after her daughter died, she toured the states talking about the dangers of drunk driving. But she didn't forgive this guy. God made her realize that she needed to forgive him before she continued on. So what she did, she began to meet with this guy. She would go visit him in prison. Until finally she got to the point in her life and she forgave him. And she took it one step farther. She went to the judge and actually on his behalf got his sentence reduced in half. And now they go around and tell their story not only about the dangers of drunk driving, but what forgiveness can do for you. And we think of the things that we have trouble forgiving for some, somebody. And this lady... Her daughter was killed, but yet she still was able to forgive him. Jesus tells us, you know, a lot of us can quote the Lord's Prayer, um, but a lot of times we stop at verse 13. Um, I want to read you this here. These are some lines to Matthew West's song. It says, it's the hardest thing to give away, the last thing on your mind today. It always goes to those that don't deserve. It's the opposite of how you feel. When the pain that causes is just too real, it takes everything you have just to say the word forgiveness. And this lady wrote in and, and she told her story and, and Matthew West put this song together. But for us, a lot of times that's how it is. But in our life, if we go back to the Lord's Prayer and we, we think about that prayer, we'll stop at verse 13. But verse 14 says, all right, I'm going to come back to this in a second. Verse 14 says, For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your Heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. This is one of those verses or these passages a lot of times we just read over and we think, well, that's not what he meant. You know, he didn't really mean that. You know, that was just kind of something that he said right then. But this is Jesus telling us this is how we should pray just the importance of forgiveness. Now, according to that, if we don't forgive those people around us, I mean, God's not going to forgive us. We start thinking how serious this is about forgiveness all of a sudden. It's not just something that we should do. Paul is commanding us. We know that forgiveness is part of how we're supposed to live our life. Um, so what I want you to do right now, normally church, they tell you to put your cell phones away or, or, or take them out. But if there is somebody that you know that you need to forgive, I want you to get out your cell phone and I want you to just send them a text. I forgive you. Let's talk later. I forgive you. Let's talk later. Because there's somebody in here, I bet, that God is saying, you need to forgive that person. You need to move on instead of allowing it just to continue to eat at you. So if there's somebody that you need to do that, you can slip out your phone, just send them a simple text. I forgive you. Let's talk later then you can be able to share with them. And maybe you can share not only that I forgive you, but let me tell you who forgave me. God forgave me because of, of everything I've done, not just one this one instance. So we start thinking about how God can, can use this to, to bring people together. But it's important that we realize that we are to bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. So, if you've got somebody, do that. Don't let it go. Make sure it's something that you take care of. But how do we do this? How, you know, we go back to this woman, think about, you know, what she must have gone through. It's love. Right here in verse 14, Paul says that, And over all these virtues put on, virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. I don't know how many of you guys ever watched uh, TV infomercials, as seen on TV stuff. That's a pretty good stuff. You need to run. It's pretty good stuff. Right? There's that one kind of cool hose, you know, that um, kind of comes up into a ball, but it's like 50 feet long. Um, there's that thing that you can get that nasty stuff on your heel. You can kind of rub around and get the stuff off your heel. Um, I have one other example I wanted to say. Um, 
Oh, the lid lizard. The thing that you can stick in your dryer, and you can suck, suck up the lid out of it. I've got one of those. It works. Uh, but one thing, you know, talk about sports and being athletic. What about the body shaper? I mean, and we're not going to check, see who has the body shaper on, but it holds everything together. That's how I can maintain this appearance. And you may laugh, I don't really have one on. But, but there are some days when I think I need it, I'm like, where did that come from? I, I know what it's called. But it's sold on TV as a body shaper. But I say that because the seriousness of how it holds everything in. And that's what Paul says here. That the way, above all these virtues, put on love which binds them all together in perfect unity. It's about love. When we realize how much God loves us and how we're supposed to love those people around us. And we see that in 1 John where he says, We love because He first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For anyone who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. It's about love. And what happens a lot of times is, you know, I had a picture of my truck up there, and over the last, um, when your vehicles go bad, a lot of times you take them to a shop, and I've had mine in and out of shop over the last month, and, and for the transmission. But when things break, they just... And to dodge. When the things break, they just replace the part. They don't necessarily fix it. They just replace it, put a new part in. And unfortunately for us, we have these bad parts in us that we just can't replace because it's called sin. But God can change who we are. He can change the, the way we look at people. The way we respond. The way we sometimes go off the handle or the way we, we need to forgive or that we don't show compassion. He is the one that can truly change us. Huh? But it's because of sin. It's because maybe something happened to us or because of, of how we've allowed ourselves to be. Huh? But as I, I got into this, and I was going to look into, I was going to preach on the rest 15 through 17, but I realized for us right now, for us in, in our two, two churches that are coming together, and I don't know what it's going to look like, I don't know when it's going to happen, but I know it's going to happen. We are going to come together as one church. I don't know what the name of it's going to be. It's irrelevant. What, what I do know is that we are going to come together. Maybe sooner, maybe later. But if we look at this, if you go back up to verse 11, I don't have this up on the screen. Paul says, here there is no Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is an all. We look out here right now, we got charity members, we got Harvest Valley members, we got Baptist people, we got Pentecostal people, we got um, community people, we got people that are, that are not sure what they are. Just like Paul says, but Christ is in all and is in all. He is all and is in all. And it's about coming together. So for us, what we need to do, because relationships kind of define the church. You know, how you treat one another in the church. When people see that, do they want to be a part of that? Or are they like, you know what? I don't know what you got going on over there, but I don't want any of that. The world lives like that. The world gets mad at somebody when they talk about them, or they think they talk about them, or, they, or this happens, or that. But that's not what we're supposed to do. That's not what we're supposed to be about. We're supposed to be about being, trying to live like Christ. And that means forgiving one another. Bearing with whatever differences that we might have with one another. Having compassion on one another. Being kind, being gentle, um, being patient. And I think for us, as we move forward, it's important that we realize that I think this passage right here is something that we've got to not only get a grasp on, but we've got to live it out. You go to Acts chapter 5, and there's a, um, a, a story where the, uh, the apostles are getting persecuted. They're out there telling people about Jesus, and they get put in put in jail, and um, they miraculously get out. And they go out again, and they're preaching again. And some of the religious leaders, they're freaking out. They're getting mad. They're thinking, what can I do to those people? How can I get to them? And Gamiel, this, this, this leader at the time, this is what he says to him. Therefore, in the present case, I advise you, leave these men alone. Let them go. For if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. But it is from God you will not be able to stop these men. 
you'll only find yourselves fighting against God. And I think for me, what I realized as I read that, us coming together, if it's just our desire, it's going to fail. If God wants us to come together, we're going to come together and there's nothing that's going to stop it. That's right. It's going to be about Him. And I think when, when we get to that point, because in the beginning it says, since then you have been raised with Christ, that's where it starts. If you have been raised with Christ, if you are in Christ, if you accepted Him, then we're able to live like this. Then we can start treating people the way God wants us to treat people. That's when people will see that. But it has to start when we get to that point where we trust Him as our Savior. Daniel brought up a great point in, in Sunday school today about a lot of times people accept Christ as their Savior. They want that, that insurance that if they die, they're going to go to heaven. But then they want to go on and live their life however they want to do it. But if you notice, it's Lord and Savior. That means He's your boss. That means you live for Him, you no longer live for yourself. So for us to carry on our relationships with those around us, if we want them to be successful, successful in God's eyes, we have to start by trusting Him. So, as we get ready to sing this song, one, if there's maybe somebody that's, that's even in here that um, what I want to kind of close with, if there's someone that maybe you don't know, maybe for this, after this last song, before they leave, go up and introduce yourself. Tell them that you're glad you're here. You may not know exactly what's going to happen as we go forward, but you're looking forward to going through it with them. And instead of, sometimes we get so tempted sometimes just to hang out with the same person that we, we always do, we don't get, we're not aware of those people around us. So, but the most important thing that you can do today is one, if you're not in Christ, meaning that you have not trusted Him as your Lord and Savior, today is the day. Because the paper is filled with reports of people that were either in accidents or that, that through disease or, or whatever it is. So we're not promised tomorrow. But we are promised to spend eternity with Christ if we trust Him.